Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is a summary of part B of chapter 2 on the historical origins of Islamic economics. This is taken from the book Islamic Economics, the Polar Opposite of Capitalist Economics. For more details about this book and summaries of the other parts, uh, consult the link given on this page. We start with a fundamental principle about Islam which has been a source of a lot of confusion. The Quran gives us complete and perfect guidance for all time. But how can it be when it doesn't teach us how to ride a horse or the principles of archery? Well, guidance really means the overall principles of conduct which remain invariant across time. Just like a compass tells us which direction to go, and that's extremely helpful because it eliminates 359 of the 360 directions on the compass. It doesn't tell us what to do to get to that direction. It doesn't tell us that there's a ditch in front of you, so don't step on that. Because along the path, there will be mountains and rivers, and it's up to us to figure out how to get across them. So the Quran guidance is that the, we have to defend the Ummah against enemies. But how to do that will vary with the time. So it can be archery or guns or artillery or planes. The technology of warfare changes across time and that is not part of the Quranic guidance. So applied to the economic realm, the Quran provides us with goals of an economic system. So there are certain moral imperatives. We should feed the hungry. We should take care of needs. There should be social responsibility. We should feel for each other like a single body. We should have common goals. And uh, we are uh, commanded to have simple lifestyles. We can have our needs and comforts, but no extravagance. Uh, modern economics is based, uh, replaces morality by rationality. And uh, this is an alternative set of morals, which is very much opposed to Islamic morals. So the founders of modern Islamic economics, Maulana Maududi and Allama Baqir Sadr, in the early 20th century, recognized the dramatic differences between the moral imperatives of an Islamic economy and uh, the goals of capitalism. And they sketched the theoretical foundations of the economic systems that would be followed by the new, newly liberated Islamic countries. And uh, they argued that this economic system would be superior to Western economic systems. So early economics, early Islamic, early modern Islamic economics is all about comparative Islamic, uh, comparative economic systems, capitalism, socialism, communism, and a theoretical and idealized Islamic economic system. Economics, Islamic economics has evolved across time, shaped by historical pressures and circumstances. The underlying spirit which is to implement the order of Allah Ta'ala in constructing a society in all dimensions, including the economic, has remained the same. But among the Muslims, there has been much difference of opinion in terms of interpreting what exactly this order of Allah Ta'ala is and what are the technical details of how to implement it in modern societies. The first wave of Islamic economics, basically from World War II to the uh, 1975, let's say, was revolutionary. They wanted an economic system which would be radically different from the capitalism and communism that were dominant in the world. And they differentiated this system from the others on the basis of social responsibility. Historically, Islamic states have provided healthcare and educational opportunities to all outside of the marketplace. And the system of Awqaf has been used for funding these. For various reasons detailed elsewhere, uh, movements to create an Islamic state did not succeed anywhere. And the institutional structure of the newly liberated colonies remained the same as it did uh, during the period of colonization. And the reason, primary reason for this was because the power elites benefited enormously from these structures. A real revolution would have empowered the masses and gone against the interests of the powerful. Faced with this failure of
One of the most important examples is the ban on interest, which has been implemented via interest-free banking, which has taken many different shapes and forms and is now widespread all over the Islamic world. To understand uh, what's going on, one has to distinguish between Sharia compliant, which means it has the form which, uh, which adopts, the, which, which obeys the letter of the law, but not necessarily the spirit. And the genuine Sharia, which would, which would be conforming in both body and spirit. So, for example, we have Musharka based mortgages now um, available in the USA. Uh, Musharka, the spirit is that the bank and the uh, borrower uh, become co-owners of the house. And so they have uh, split, they have, they have common interests uh, in uh, the appreciation of the house. Uh, as opposed to interest where the bank is uh, completely separate from the ownership, completely separated from the ownership. Uh, the actual musharka is followed in um, different ways, but mostly we have uh, imit imitation musharka contracts where the ownership is there on paper, but not in reality. Uh, and so there are uh, many different types of contracts and some of these will be discussed. Uh, another example of this spirit versus body is the uh, case of takaful versus insurance. Now the genuine takaful is a born out of a spirit of cooperation trying to help each other. Whereas insurance is just a gamble between two parties in which the interests are adversarial opposed to each other. So modern day takaful follows the letter of Islamic law by using various kinds of waqf and uh, uh, various kinds of strategies to create compliance but really resembles uh, insurance in terms of its spirit. And this has been a problem uh, because the it's hard to get genuine Islamic spirited institutions within uh, a capitalist economic. Looking at it from a broader perspective, all of uh, the knowledge produced over the past five centuries by the European civilization is highly Eurocentric. It focuses solely on Europe and ignores all other civilizations. By global conquest and colonization, this worldview was spread all over the globe. And today it is perpetuated by Western education. There are no serious alternatives to Western education available anywhere today. And so uh, we are perforce uh, feeding a Western worldview to all uh, students all across the Islamic world. And uh, so many have, necessite, uh, we have many have recognized the necessity of creating uh, an Islamic variant or Islamizing the knowledge that is currently available uh, so that we can create a genuine Islamic alternative to Western education. And Islamic economics is just one part of this overall effort to create an alternative structure of knowledge to the Eurocentric Western one.